Uh, we are in offshore wind, so the the context of the project we are delivering at the moment and um, with funding from the Offshore Wind Growth Partnership. Uh, I'll talk you through some of the industry pain points that we identified and why we believe VR will be of such um, great benefit to the industry, but then also some of the challenges we've identified in rolling it out, uh, you know, widely across the industry, at least at the moment, and it would be great to get people's thoughts on those and, and perhaps you know, some, some ideas for how they could be, they could be overcome. And as I said, I, I, you know, the discussion here is what's so valuable. So I'd also really appreciate questions people have. I don't so to talk a little bit more about Ray, Ray was established in 2017 by um, Niall Campion and Pat O'Connor. Um, um, yeah. Sorry. Oh, maybe that was an, that was a mistake. <laughs> um, so Niall's background is in um, VFX and filmmaking, and then Pat's background is in um, the defence uh, forces in in Ireland. And they came together really because they identified a need for um, more effective training in hazardous environments. I suppose Pat's context being, you know, particularly hazardous in in the defence forces. And then Niall bringing his storytelling background and kind of technical expertise to bear on that. And Bray, Bray was born from that. So we specialize in data-driven VR simulation um, for high hazard environments. And we combine virtual reality and artificial intelligence to make simulation training more authentic, memorable, and measurable. So we are focused on helping customers in a range of industries, um, aerospace, defense, and now you know offshore wind. And we work with um, the likes of the RAF in the UK, the Irish Defense Forces, um, the Irish Air Corps Search and Rescue Team, um, and now OEMs in um, the offshore wind industry. And our insight really is that VR, as well as being a great way to present data to a user is also an incredible way to capture, measure and predict performance by collecting and analyzing data from user performances within VR. And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly and a bit more of kind of about the, the company culture we have. So we believe in creating shared value for our customers, investors, employees and community. And we have adopted and the triple bottom line. So we measure our success equally across people, product, and planet. And we have adopted the B Corporation Constitution. So our company has a legal obligation to focus not only on profit, but also on our impact on people and the planet. And we want to create a work environment where people feel empowered and who can develop a sense of mastery over their work and purpose in what we are trying to achieve together. So that summarizes Ray. And to talk then in a bit more detail about VR, um, there are different types of, of VR, and we certainly we, we cover all of them. Um, there's 360 degree video, and that is comprised of live action footage. So that's going out and filming with a 360 degree camera, and then presenting that back. You stitch it together, you present it back, and somebody can can stand within that world and they can they can move you know the the view around but there's no interaction um, and the filmmaker in many ways controls that narrative the user might be able to select you know to jump from one point to another but they can't actually interact or change the story and that's uh the kind of vr that you would um, see on you know platforms like youtube or or 360 degree enabled devices and then the next type would be three degrees of freedom so that's when there is some interaction, you know, if you move your head around in the environment, you're actually going to move the camera so you can, you know, look up, down and around um, just by moving your head and it's, it's the same as if you were there. But again, you're not really able to touch objects, you're not able to, to pick them up, and move them around. And then full immersion, which is what we primarily focus on for, for VR training is six degrees of freedom. So you can interact with objects, you can um, move within your own space and you will move in VR. And really it's about as real as it gets without actually being in that environment. And particularly for high hazard environments and for the kind of um, complex 
training scenarios that we typically focus on, that's where you want to be. Something that's going to be extremely um, authentic and memorable for the user because they're actually going to feel like they really were there. And how that works is we create a CG environment um, replicating the real world kind of one for one as much as as much as possible it depends on the context and and where the the real value is but you're creating 3d digital twins of all of the objects um the the environment around the person and then focusing i suppose on those key objects that are going to be um heavily used in the training so that they behave um and respond as they would uh, if someone was interacting with them in the real world And VR is um, the VR that we we work in is typically used through a VR headset, and uh, there are a couple of different types of VR headsets. Well, there's many different types, but you can do standalone. Uh, so that would be a VR headset that it it arrives in a box. You take it out of the box. You put it on. You, you know, there's there's no connection to a computer or anything, and those are, I suppose, particularly of benefit where you have large groups of people, maybe in a, in a classroom or, or spread out across your workforce who you want to deliver training to and you want the minimal um, kind of user setup. You want to make it as, as kind of streamlined as possible. And then there's the tethered VR. So that's when you're connecting it to a computer. Um, and the I suppose the difference there is you're talking about a, a much more power and um, you know, better computer graphics. It's not to say that the, the standalone ones aren't good too. They, they certainly are. Um, but we would use those largely in, for example, the defense industry. That's one place where Tethered would come into it a lot. And what that also allows is to create kind of instructor controlled situations. So you can have an instructor who is maybe manipulating an environment or creating a scenario and then pushing that to somebody's VR headset so that you can dynamically change the, the learning as you're going along. And you move within VR um, and interact with objects using controllers quite often, and that would be the standard, and certainly all headsets would come with controllers for that reason. But you can also integrate, you know, joysticks and pedals, an example um, from something else we're doing at the moment with the RAF would be we've used a, a standard off the shelf tethered VR headset with a computer, but we've integrated joystick pedals, throttle, um, and quite a bit of other equipment from a real aircraft so that they're able to essentially create their own aircraft sim simulator. Um, but at a much uh, lower cost than you know the, the kind of multi-million pound simulators that are very location based um, that people would often then have to travel to in order to train on them. Whereas this is something that can be easily packed up, moved around and delivered at, at the point of need. And then if you're getting really advanced, uh, you can use haptic gloves or even Tesla suits. We have another project at the moment involving um, Tesla suits and the haptic feedback that comes from that. So essentially what this means is you're giving the user um, the ability to get a, a, a response uh, from, from the VR environment. So when they press something, they really feel it on their fingers that they're actually pressing a button, for example. And that, again, it can really enhance the realism. It's something that's not necessary for, for every use case, but um, where it's appropriate, it certainly does add hugely to, to how authentic that, that training feels. Um, and then I've just listed some of the manufacturers there. You know, there, there are many, but the main ones would be Oculus, who are also owned by, by Facebook, HTC, HP, and Pico Interactive. And much like with anything, the variations between them uh, are down to, you know, quality and cost, but certainly all are very good and deliver, I suppose, different uh, products suitable to, to different contexts. So to move on to the benefits of, of VR, and we typically say we make VR for operational environments that are risky, remote, or rare. So risky is, I think, pretty self-explanatory. Um, you're going out to a, a, a wind farm and a high seas, wind, slippery, um, you know, all of those things, noisy. That's a, a risky environment. Um, remote then is 
where it's difficult to get people to the environment, the, the real environment that you would want to do the training for. And then rare is those contexts that you hope happen very infrequently. So we have a, a another project at the moment where we are providing training in VR to the to a search and rescue crew uh, in the Irish Air Corps. And what we're training for is that rare occasion where they will have to cut the uh, winch operator, uh, the winchman, the person who's going down on a winch to, you know, rescue a, a casualty, they have to cut them loose because of you've gotten snagged in something um, or something has gone wrong. And this is your, your kind of only other option to save the, the people within that aircraft. But it means, you know, it's very likely that your colleague who is at the end of the winch is, is not going to survive that. So that's a very rare occurrence, you hope. Um, but naturally training for that in real life is, it's almost impossible to simulate that. So that's where VR can really come in and it will give you the impression that you're really experiencing it, but it'll also train, you know, the muscle memory that you need to perform those actions when required. The benefits of VR are cost reductions via reduced training time. So VR typically takes less time than it would to deliver the same training in a real environment because the logistics involved, you know, you don't need people to kind of all travel together to the same site, you can just as easily send VR headsets out to them and they can do the training at home, they can do it at work, they can do it, you know, we had somebody ask us recently if, if you could do them, you know, out on vessels that are out at wind farms and absolutely if there's either an internet connection or you can actually do offline versions, people could be training out there during downtime. And then you can practice safely before doing the job for real. So that's really where VR's huge advantage is. You are able to do something over and over and over again in VR um, before going out and having to perform it on you know, the real equipment or real people, and, you know, putting yourself at, at risk or your colleagues at risk. Prevent skills fade. And that's something that I'll, I'll talk a bit about later, but it's something that has been identified um, to us repeatedly when we've been talking to stakeholders in the offshore wind industry that, um, you know, there's the standardized training system. Everybody goes through uh, certain trainings and they have to be um, recertified every couple of years. But in between, people are not getting as many opportunities maybe as, as they should to continue to maintain those skills. And so the danger is always that, you know, you get to kind of the close to the end of two years before you actually need that skill you learned two years ago and, and then the knowledge just isn't there or it's not kind of coming back as quickly as, as you would hope. So this allows you to just, whenever you have time, um, just keep practicing and keep familiar with what's required. Improve training outcomes. And this is one that I, there, you know, there are whole research industries built up around how people learn. And I think what it boils down to, and I think one we can all relate to is, you know, people learn by doing. The theory is obviously very important and, and you know, taking that on board before you do, do the practical elements is, is vital. But for example, we, we often kind of talk about if you were to, to get into a plane and you were told that the pilot had only learned to fly the plane in a PowerPoint presentation, you know, you probably get off the plane. And so really people, they learn by doing and they, that involves, you know, having as much access to the, the actual practical environment as possible. So you get better outcomes um, if you give people that opportunity and, and VR is, is going to provide that again and again. Dynamic data capture to monitor performance is kind of a, a unique selling point for what we do. We have a data capture pipeline that we integrate with all of our VR training, where we are capturing uh, three different types of information about the people performing within VR. So the tasks that they're doing, um, the user's own information, you know, who that person is, how much experience they have, and then the success factors. So the tasks they were doing, did they complete them successfully? What does success mean? How is that defined? You know, what is the difference between how quickly or effectively this person performed the task versus that person? And what that means on a basic level is, 
you know, it's a, a very efficient way of keeping track of the, the skill level of, of your workforce. But where it really comes into its own is when you start applying machine learning to look at trends across a workforce. So you can start to see, you know, there's actually this particular aspect of this um, process is a problem for 80% of, of people working for us. So you realize we need to identify a better way of doing this or a better way of training this. And you can really pinpoint those, those pain points in that process and then dynamically improve that. When you have large enough data sets, then you can also start looking kind of across, you know, glo globally. If we have systems that are being used by people, you know, all over the world, you can, again, start to find those, those consistencies and inconsistencies between them. And you can rule out um, differences in training standards as delivered by maybe different instructors. That's definitely something that VR um, always overcomes because it's so objective. You know, there's, there's kind of no bias or skill level involved in the actual delivery of it. And then it's repeatable at scale, um, much like I said about being able to send the headsets around um, to wherever the point of need is, you know, adding more training capacity is as simple as adding, adding more headsets. And so it's something that can constantly be, be increased or decreased depending on the demand. Uh, some examples then of, of where we've applied this before. So we worked with the United Nations Mine Action Service um, in Somalia, focusing on counter IED and imp improvised uh, explosive device training for soldiers. And we've produced an immersive VR experience to raise awareness of that work. So this was a 360 degree um, VR experience. And we went to Somalia, we actually filmed with um, the African Union mission. And we're traveling from Mogadishu to one of their bases um, 30 kilometers outside the city. And we used filmmaking techniques like staging um, the aftermath of you know, an IED explosion. Um, a lot of questions were raised when we brought the props of, with, I think there was a, a leg with a bone protruding from it that had to be brought over on an airplane and uh, that was used. But the point was we were making the experience as memorable as possible. And the people who went through it, the feedback we got afterwards was that it was so visceral and it felt so real that they had a far greater appreciation of what was involved in this work and the dangers of this work afterwards. And one of the key things that we learned, apart from, apart from, I suppose, that the benefits of that realism were by tracking how people were moving their heads within the experience. We were able to say that people who were moving their heads slowly from left to right I correctly identified more IEDs than people who were sort of looking left, right, up, down, and doing it in a less systematic way. And in some ways, that might sound like an obvious learning, but we were able to, I suppose, show empirically in the data that that is in fact true. And they were able to then update how they trained that skill in people. Apologies. And then the RAF um, project that I mentioned earlier is another one that's ongoing at the moment. So um, we won a defense and security accelerator contract to develop a system to measure, codify, and predict pilot performance using VR and data analytics. So the target is to develop a method of assessing airmanship, which is a skill that's you know, difficult to objectively assess. It's that quality. Um, you know, if you were driving a car initially, obviously you're learning to, to use the gears and um, the pedals, the steering wheel, everything. But that moment that you switch from not having to think about any of that anymore to just driving and being a good driver, you know, what is that? We kind of all recognize it when we see it, but it's very difficult to objectively put down, put down on paper what that is. So we are developing a method of assessing that and this benchmark will then be used to assess trainees. Um, so you can then look at, well, this is what an expert does and this is what their data tells us. Here's a novice, how can we see what's different in their data so that we can um, kind of tailor training to them to increase their abilities in particular areas where there are those big differences between them and um, somebody more expert. 
you can fast track more skilled novices. You know, you can identify, well, actually this person is, is more advanced than you know, perhaps other people at that level. So you can um, move them into you know, deployment far earlier, which again, reduce costs and improves your efficiency. And then tailor training, like I said, um, you can target specific areas where you can see that people um, maybe need a little bit more attention. And then with large enough data sets, you can actually start to predict performance outcomes. So when you have enough information, you can start to say, well, people who do X, Y, and Z are actually, you know, this much more likely to perform correctly when presented with this situation. So really, I suppose, once you get into the data, the possibilities are endless there, but essentially any question that you could want to ask um, to understand performance can be answered um, using the data. So to talk specifically then about um, the offshore wind industry. So we all know that there's going to be a huge need for, for more staff um, over the coming years. And it's, it's a growing industry. So the demand for training is only going to, going to increase. Um, traditional training in the wind industry can be difficult to scale. And it can be difficult to objectively quantify in its effectiveness. Now, that's, that's absolutely not to say it's not, not effective, but it can be um, I suppose down to instructor um, determination of you know who's performing well and who's not and again where you can bring in the data to sort of say objectively you know this person in comparison to this person um, is, is not as efficient or not as effective um, that's just really an added benefit here and traditional simulators you know they're fixed to one location they're only available um, at the moment to kind of very high value jobs like pilot surgeons, specialist military roles. I know there are some in offshore wind as well, but you have to transport, you know, your workforce to those simulators. You can't set them up in your office. And so that's what we're offering by using off the shelf hardware. You can, you can create that wherever it's needed. And the risk and cost, you know, Fortune 500 companies spending 100 billion on training last year and the majority of those companies suffered a death or serious injury in the workplace so there's a huge need um, for robust training for for these contexts and the uh, traditional training and traditional simulators they they don't really have that data capture that we offer um, and the yeah, subjective instructor assessments that i mentioned already are largely how um, somebody's performance is, is quantified. So here's the summary of, of HEAT, and this is what, what we offer in all of our training, is the ability to manage your trainees, so your trainee profiles, and the ability to enable remote training. You know, somebody goes and does the training, you don't need to be there. You can see afterwards in the data that they've done it and how they performed. Our solutions are hardware agnostic. You can integrate them with third party, for example, in our RAF project, we're working with um, Prepared 3D, which is a industry standard existing um, VR simulation software. So we didn't create it, we're just using it to get the data out. And it's scalable, it's standardized. And then the data pipeline that I mentioned already, and when you apply machine learning, um, the metrics that you can generate from that, we present on a dashboard and in reports. So again, the data, you don't have to analyze the data. Our system does that and then presents it back to you in meaningful insights. I think I mentioned quite a bit of this already, but uh, to actually put a number on how much data we're capturing, it's over 500,000 data points per minute, which is quite a lot. <laughs> and um, the way that we provide in terms of costs, we provide this as a, as a service as opposed to kind of an upfront um, bulk payment, you know, to create the, the, the system. So you use it and pay for it when you need it, um, whether that's by hour or, you know, kind of a, a ongoing, ongoing license. So it just makes it a lot more accessible to people because that is one of the pain points we identified in the industry is the upfront cost of developing bespoke training was just quite off-putting for a lot of people. So we've, we're removing that and presenting it to people as kind of a pay-as-you-go service. 
So the Offshore Wind Growth Partnership Project we have at the moment in which Durham is, is, is partnering um, with, on, with us on is to develop a, a basic safety training module to global wind organization standards in VR. And after quite a lot of discussion back and forth with a lot of different people in the beginning, we, we decided on the fire awareness training module. And we are developing it with um, the support of some subject matter experts in, in one of the manufacturers. I can't talk about that for, for NDA reasons, but it's, it's part of you know, their commitment to industry-wide training standards. And it's generic training. So this will be, you know, as with GWO, it's not specific to any one manufacturer, developer, or context. It can be used by anyone. It will be, uh, it will be designed to complement a blended learning approach. So the theory will be delivered in classroom or online, whatever you know suits the, the provider best. But then the practical skills are demonstrated, practiced, and applied in VR. And anyone you know, who has that GWO certification can then offer this as part of their training. And the data capture will be included with it and the training management. So that's the first phase of, of that project. And then the next phase would be where we hope to get to is to have a platform that's hosting offshore and onshore wind training. And that would be kind of a one-stop shop where we would host content from other VR training creators and integrate our data capture pipeline to that. And uh, the idea here is that it would be a solution for the industry where, you know, good VR training can, can live so that there's kind of a, an industry standard and sort of a, a, an assurance that comes with that around the quality of training that's being delivered. And then we can use the data uh, to generate insights in the workforce, you know, key predictors of outcomes, inform safety standards across the industry. We're also looking at developing um, customizable scenario creation tools like we have in other industries. And that would allow people to create their own um, situations that they want to put people through. So if you have particular emergencies you want to train in your turbine, you can actually create those, push those to the headset and have people go through that. And it just gives people a lot more control of the environment within VR, but without having to commission a new VR training solution every time. The pain points then, um, and all of this came out of, uh, I suppose, those lengthy discussions we were involved in at the start of the, the OWGP project. Um, People identified, you know, the logistics of organizing group training, particularly for emergency drills. You've got a lot of technicians spread out, kind of all over the all over the country, and you have to get them together to train in person at the same time, and that can be challenging. Whereas in VR, you can actually have multiple people spread anywhere in the world, all training in the same environment at the same time. We have a system doing that at the moment for it's a mind awareness training um, tool and they use it to train people simultaneously anywhere in the world in the same in the same um, scenario. The cost of travel and overnights and then uh, creating those realistic complex and dangerous scenarios for training purposes. Um, giving each trainee equal time to practice during training. Again, in a lot of traditional training, you can have a lot of people standing around. You know, if there's only a few um, fire extinguishers available, you know, people have to wait. Whereas, again, if you have uh, everybody doing it in VR, everybody can be spending all of their time training with the, the equipment. Skills fade, which I mentioned earlier. Downtime during weather days was one that came up a lot and people saying that it would be really beneficial if there was a, a kind of on-site training solution that people could uh, take advantage of so that that time could be spent really efficiently, again, preventing skills fade perhaps. Providing a reality check um, in an educational context. So people talk to us about kind of people dropping out perhaps once they actually get to experience what it's like to be on a turbine for real. Whereas if you get people more familiar with the environment before going into it and they may realize, you know, this isn't for me, or they may say, absolutely, this is for me and, and keep going. And the standardization of training for a global workforce, again, ensuring that what you're delivering is going to be exactly the same, regardless of who's delivering it. The transition of oil and gas technicians to offshore wind was a really interesting one, um, that obviously they have a lot of the same safety standards and, and same training procedures, but um, just a, a way of more rapidly bringing them on board, I guess, to, to fit in the new 
the new environment um, could be really beneficial. And objective skill assessment, and I talked about that um, already with, with our data capture. So lastly, the challenges in industry rollout um, that have come up and that we're, we're trying to address. So widespread acceptance, you know, there, there isn't a huge legacy of simulation training in offshore wind the way there would be in aviation, for example, you know, flight simulation training is almost as old as the aviation industry. They've been training pilots in simulation um, since the beginning, whereas here it's, it's still relatively new. But VR is being used by some OEMs and developers, but quite often it's, it's bespoke or it's proprietary to their own systems, and it's not necessarily going to be shared outside of, outside of the organizations themselves. So with something like um, our project where we're, we're creating you know, a GWO standard, um, fire awareness training, the idea is that it's generic and so anybody can use it. And third party training providers, we, we spoke to um, certainly, you know, we're very interested in, and see this as the future, but some expressed um, the, I suppose they, they talked about the challenge that they need the demand to come from, from higher up. So they need people looking for this before they can, they can invest in it. So you, there's kind of a, a chicken and egg thing going on there. Um, and the upfront cost of developing the virtual environments, you know, it's, it isn't uh, a small thing to create a, a CG, um, you know, wind farm with every component of a, of a turbine um, replicated realistically. But what we've done here is by using the OWGP grant to create that, we have reduced that upfront cost so that people can... Um, I suppose use use it at, in a pay as you go kind of way without having to have that that obstacle at the beginning. And training modules with an emphasis on tactile elements, so strength, very fine motor skills, is not high value in VR, and that's something we're always very clear on with people. You know, VR does not provide a solution for everything. There are certainly some things that VR is not good at, and where it's not going to provide additional value, um, like putting on a, a life jacket. You know, you're you're going to learn to do that far better in real life than you are in VR. So that's one thing where we'd always say, you know, leave that where it is, but where you can incorporate that into training is. Um, it's the, the muscle memory and that process that you can learn. So having somebody practice that, yes, they do have to go and get that life jacket. They have to put it on in this particular context over and over and over again in VR. And then, you know, you're going to remember it when you actually are faced with that emergency in real life. Acceptance for health and safety, legal and compliance purposes. Basically just having that assurance that for legal reasons, this training will deliver the same quality as the traditional training and um, the on-site training people would be used to up till now. Industry standards for good and best practice VR. So it's it's obviously still a new enough thing that um, there is no kind of global governing standard for what is good VR and what isn't. And then VR creators like ourselves are not usually training providers. So we don't provide training. You know, we don't have internal um, subject matter experts in offshore wind training. And so we always work with people who are subject matter experts within the organizations that we work with. Um, but it does create interesting challenges around how do we then get our products out to people. We have to partner with third party training providers or with manufacturers themselves. And um, because again, we don't, uh, we don't book people in for training um, or kind of get into that, that level of detail. So that can be um, an interesting challenge to have to overcome. So uh, I guess I'm conscious that that took me a little longer than I thought it was. And I was kind of trying to hurry through it there at the end and um, to get to the discussion. So maybe will we just jump in and, and start talking about everybody's questions? Um, if there are any, Simon. Okay, yeah, thanks, Fran. So, so uh, if you have uh, questions for Fran, if you can, uh, uh, I, I struggle to see hands up here. So if you can put them in the chat or or just speak, that would be uh, that would be okay. And to get us to get us going, Fran. Um, just while you were talking there, how thinking about the offshore wind industry and the fact that people are going to be th those receiving the training are likely to be very dispersed around uh, 
well, around the world, uh, is, the, is the vision then that, that, that they would all have a headset as a, as a standard uh, piece of, of kit with them? Because I, I guess, you know, you would need some sort of hardware in order to participate in the training. So how, how's that going to work? Yeah, now it depends on the organization. I think some companies, they, they already have quite a lot of their own VR headsets and, um, you know, you could have those at a training center. And so when people are maybe coming into work, they're just, or yeah, even have it at a base, you know, people can just go into the room, use the headsets, but they're also, the beauty of them is they can just be put in the post. So what we do at the moment for quite a lot of our, our customers is we just post them from person to person um, as needed. And that way they're not sitting there, you know, unused for all of the time that, you know, people aren't in training. Um, and it, it, it's very straightforward and uh, very efficient. So yeah, everybody in, then in theory can easily have access to one without you having to buy one for every single person in the company. Although I guess you'd probably argue that the costs anyway of buying one are, are small compared with the costs of traveling to the time spent traveling to yeah. and from. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, anybody got any questions for Fran? Uh, hi Fran, I've got a question yet. It's uh, David Tate from MPI Offshore. Hey. Um, very interesting um, presentation. Yeah, one, one of the um, uses we can see really is the is when we do complex lifts with the with the vessel, mm -hmm. a very uh, heavy crane lifting very sensitive equipment, uh, wind wind sensitive equipment, and we're just kind of going into what we used to do on a two D drawing storyboard to explain the lift to the deck superintendents. We are now producing three D drawings and uh, 3D animations to give the guys an idea of, of, the, of, the, of the lift um, and obviously uh, the clash points in the lift. But going from that 3D to a VR, I, I yeah. the next step that we could do, we could, we could set up the toolbox talks on the vessel. The guys could have the, the headsets on it and actually visually do, or actually do the lift in the VR environment uh, before and see, and see what the critical points of the, of the lift are, so. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. So not just like going to yeah and, and uh, yeah hopefully going forward we'd have a room a dedicated room on the vessel that could be the VR room and and uh, it could be incorporated into the into the toolbox talks before before the lifting. Yeah, that sounds like a, a perfect example of where VR really comes into its own and you know the the beauty is you can obviously go through this is what's supposed to happen you know you create yeah. that in VR this is what it looks like when it's being done correctly but then you can have you know. What we do with people is we work through then what are all of the things you don't want to happen and then you create all of those in vr so that you can teach the person how to react to them so that right. by the time that thing does happen in real life which yeah. you obviously hope it won't they know exactly what to do because it's almost muscle memory yeah. at that point because yeah. i assume you're lifting something there is the slimmest of possibilities something snaps something start you know well it's the unknown I mean, our, our, our biggest um threats of the wind obviously is oh, okay and we're lifting these very uh, light uh, wind sensitive uh, blades or rotor stars uh, if the wind picks it up we have winches on the deck to to compensate but it's a, it's a very quick reaction from the guys to to be able to to, to control these uh, these components if the wind catches it the wrong way and it, it starts yeah. to you can, as you say there you could simulate that uh, as a scenario i guess and, and let's see what what yeah. guys do if that actually does happen yeah yeah, absolutely. And the um, training I mentioned earlier for the Air Corps, the, the search and rescue team, that's one of the abilities the instructor will have. So we created, it's essentially a, an instructor customization tool. So while the helicopter, you know, the guys are in, in the headsets, they're, they're flying, they're doing their mission, the instructor can increase the wind speed, which in turn affects how the helicopter moves, how the target moves. If it's a boat on the sea, you know, it starts turning into the wind or away from the wind. It starts rocking depending on how high the waves then get in response to the wind. Um, and it just means that you're able to test live, you know, okay, what are these, yeah. what, what's this team gonna do? Are they gonna, you know, turn the helicopter in the way they're supposed to, to respond in order to slow down that spin or, you know, what happens if they don't? And it, all of that is is programmed um, mm. in detail. So yeah, you, yeah. you can test all of those things. Yeah, and it's how it's how realistic, I guess. You you make that environment. Then how it's all down to the your input of this model to to simulate that that uh, wind increase in wind. How realistic will it will it um, apply it to the components? So when it does start to spin, is it 
is it likely to happen like that in real life, which is the skill X? Yeah, it, you know, it's a really good question. I suppose it can be extremely true to life. You know, you're, what we do with, with all of these things we, we create is we have somebody one of our developers kind of working with somebody then on the other side on I suppose it's it's the mathematics of that yeah. it's knowing how fast a spin can you get in response to this wind speed and then it's a case of um, and I'm certainly not a developer so I'm not going to make it seem like this is simple but it is a case of just programming that yeah um so you know in the same way that like in the aviation industry you know fighter pilots are are almost entirely taught in simulation training before they get to fly an F-35 for real, precisely because there is only one cockpit in those. They can't actually have an instructor up there with them. So that there is a way to have the wind speeds and the effect on an aircraft as realistic as is necessary for somebody to be able to get into that plane for the first time and fly it solo. So obviously that's an extreme example, but there, mm -hmm. it, it can absolutely then be, be um, deployed in this context. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. Hi, can I just ask a question uh, just to bring up on that point? Um, hi, Fran. Um, hey. Hi, I've done some work um, with the MOD and um, in various projects similar to this, um, both privately and at Teesside University as well with the emergency services. And to pick up on the last point, I think it's it's going to be more and more important to go towards the point of failure. You, you mentioned about wind speed. Um, mm -hmm. There's a there's a general acceptance that you take it to nine out of ten at the moment, um, and you program for nine out of ten. But the discussions that we're having with huge businesses and these mega corporations that we have to take it to the fail state as well, um, and I think that's where the the next leap is going to be. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, it, you know, it's a horrendous situation, but you have to train for the disaster. Uh, and once you get to that point, then you can bring in, you know, emergency saves and, and, and rescue and, and how did you, what went wrong with the equipment, what went wrong with the, you know, the, the to bring back to the last point, what went wrong with the, the equipment that measured the speed of the wind on that particular day that would call it off that, um, so I, for us, that's where it's going in the future. Um, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm working with some of the Formula One teams at the moment and the Ministry of Defence. Um, so they've all got an interest in this, but they all say in a similar thing, let's go to the, the 10 out of 10 rather than the eight and the nine that, that we have been doing at the moment. So I'm very interested in this project and, and the work that you're doing as a company as well, Fran. Great, yeah. yeah. I you're absolutely right. It it does make logical sense that that's where you want this to go to. You want to be able to train for th that one thing that there is the remotest of possibilities of, but that if it does happen, it's catastrophic. Um, and I think where we're at is kind of like I said earlier around the widespread acceptance in the industry. One of the things we were talking to to people about as we went along was you know, we were thinking of increasingly complex scenarios and going, well, what if we could train for this specific failure in this context? And people kind of just said, you know what, let's take a step back for a minute. And actually, if we can get people to kind of walk first with this and show them the benefits in just day-to-day -day training, um, you know, like fire safety, then we can actually push to, well, actually, let's have, you know, a full evacuation because something has has gone on fire and, and you need to get out. And I, I think it makes a lot of sense, but that's absolutely where we'd see it going to. Yeah, I think it depends on the project and it depends on the client as well. But I think in the in the research in the background, as long as the system is is able to go to the hundred um, percent when you're coding it and developing it, and I think then you're you're always on to a, a winner really, and it's expandable as well from that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I guess, Fran, for, for any of these points, you know, the, the point of today's event is is to increase awareness and, and create new contacts as well. So I guess you're, you're happy for any of these discussions to continue via email or whatever after the event. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be delighted to, to follow up with anybody. Okay, great. So there's a question in, in the chat there from, from Chong Eng at the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Chong, do you want to just ask your question rather than me reading it out? 
Yeah, I thought I'd try to use the chat <laughs> rather than just talk it through here. Anyway, so basically, Frank, th thanks very much for the for the very interesting presentation here. And basically, in the in the in the level mount turbine, our offshore wind turbine that we use, we actually have the 360 degrees of camera within mm. the nacelle, and basically we, we we capture different spots so, so that we can remotely monitor the, the turbine to a certain extent. Yeah. It's it just because in, in the past, we always want to get into the VR, the CG sort of environment to create those things. But the, the feedback to us is it takes forever to create these things. So for, from your experience, roughly what sort of time scale we are talking about is weeks, months, or we need years to start to create a, a useful internal environment in the virtual form. So the good news is you're talking weeks well it, it depends it depends exactly um what you're looking to use it for but to to talk about specifically for the fire awareness training what we've done is we are recreating um the inside of the nacelle of the port of Blythe's training turbine and what we've done is we've worked with a company who are also based in the port of Blythe um who are doing a scan of the the turbine a really really high resolution scan and they did the scan in i think it was an afternoon sent it to us and our team of 3d developers is just ingesting that scan and turning it into uh, the virtual environment and i think all together by the end of it to go from them taking the scan on site to us having a vr environment of like an exact reproduction of that space will be less than two weeks um, so actually part of the reason we wanted to do that in this, in this research project was to see, you know, how viable is that for precisely the reason that you've outlined, you know, how long does it take? And certainly if you were to try and do it purely manually, you know, 3D developers creating every single bolt in, you know, in every single piece of equipment, that is going to take quite a lot of time and that's where your cost is really going to come in. But, um, so far we have found the scan to be hugely successful and that's going to cut the time dramatically. Excellent. That, 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 that's really encouraging. So mm -hmm. basically we, we have done quite a bit of work on the, 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 the background, the engine of the condition monitoring. We try to create a digital twin sort of system of the turbine. And now we, we would like to combine that one with the visual sort of um, environment. So okay. that when something, something pop up saying something might have a short life in the, in the next few months, we can start to send people in virtually to start to, to, to diagnose what could be the problem. Okay, yeah. yeah. Amazing. I, I can certainly follow up with you afterwards about this and, and talk you through what we've done um, because, yeah, it was kind of a new area for us too and we're delighted that it has worked so well. So be very happy to, to, to share any insights there. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So the tur uh, Fran, the turbine you're talking about there, is that the, is that the Samsung 7 megawatt? Offshore wind turbine up at Le Leaving Mouth. Uh, no, it's a Vestas. Is it a V sixty six? The one that's onshore. Okay. Uh, so it's it's the one that Blythe uses in its training um, at the moment, and it's it's in a cell just kind of sitting on the port, and obviously in, in our version it'll be out at sea in its its original mm -hmm. habitat. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but it's not a it's not a mock up then. It's an actual in a cell. Yeah, it's a retired in a cell. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Any final question for Fran before we wrap up? Okay, if not, if not, then I've put my contact details here for anybody who, who'd like to reach out. You know, get get more information about what we're doing. Throw any any ideas at us further. Um, we we would really love to talk to people. We're obviously very excited about what we can do in the industry.